The lesson is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God, pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. So that with the eyes of your heart to light you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us to believe? According to the working of his great power, God put this power in work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet, and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to take some time to invite the kids to come forward. We'll have a little time together, so if you want to come on down and sit with me up here. Confirmation kids included on down. Kids at heart. Kids in college. On down. Alright, good to see you all again this morning. How are you today? How are you? Good?
have money, right? Kings usually have money, so there you go. There you go. Okay, what else do kings have? What else do kings wear? What else? Anything else? They wear clothes, but they wear fancy clothes, don't they? Yep. So, so something like this, they wear long robes, don't they? Long robes. So I've got a long robe here. That's what a king has. Kings wear long, fancy robes. Yep. What else do kings have? Probably have expensive jewelry, right? Does anybody have any expensive jewelry, like a diamond? Necklace, or anybody have a necklace? Ne necklace? You have a necklace. <laughs> she can give it up her diamond. <laughs>
And then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. And then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are cursed, depart from me into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no clothing, to, no, nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Well, today is Christ the King Sunday. It is the last Sunday of the church year, but the Sunday when we ask one of the most important questions of our faith, or probably one of the most culminating questions of our faith. Lord, when did we see you? When did we see you? in this world. And then Jesus answers, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, members of my family, you did it unto me, and you saw me. So Jesus offers these words in a parable on the final judgment, the only over description of it that we find in all of the New Testament. They are words that have always kind of put a knot in my stomach as I read them and as I study them. I mean, we're all gathered before the throne of God, and with judgment we are being rendered upon, based upon where we see Jesus, and, and how we have fed the hungry in this life, how we've clothed the naked, how we've cared for the sick, how we've visited prisoners, how we welcome the strangers, and it, at least for me, seems kind of overwhelming. I mean, I, I try to help people when I can. I always try to look people in the eye. I always try to offer respect to people, even people that I, I do not know. But I certainly don't do it to everyone. I mean, surely there are people like you that I've walked by who have been in need, that I've forgotten to help, either because I didn't have the inclination to help them, or maybe simply because I could not help them. And so the setting of this parable is that judgment day, when Jesus is asking us, well, how did you feed the hungry? How did you clothe those who had no clothing? How did you visit those who were sick? How did you see me? in the world. And when I start to think about all of the people in need, and I consider how vulnerable the least of these are in this life, I can easily get overwhelmed in this parable so easily haunts me. Truth to tell, it always has haunted me. When did we see you, Jesus? When did we see you in this world? What an extraordinary question. When did we see you, Jesus? How have we fed the hungry? How have we clothed the naked? How have we cared for the sick? 
said, how we visited the prisoner, how we welcomed the stranger. That's how we see Jesus. That's precisely how we see Jesus. And according to today's gospel, that's the question every single one of us, indeed every single person there's ever been and ever will be, will be asked by Jesus on Judgment Day. How did you do these things in this life? When did we see you naked? When did we see you hungry, Jesus? When did we see you thirsty or sick or in prison or as a stranger? When did we see you, Jesus, in all of these things? And then we think about it. And we think about the gospel story when Jesus was crucified, when Jesus was beaten, when Jesus suffered on the cross and was crucified. Wasn't it then that Jesus was naked? Did others see Jesus at that time? I think that when we forget that we see Jesus in all of these things, that we see Jesus hungry or thirsty or naked or everything else, we are, in essence, forgetting the gospel story. Jesus, at the very beginning of the gospel, spends 40 days in the wilderness. Do you remember that story? Where Jesus doesn't eat or drink anything for 40 days. Do you think he was hungry? Do you think he was thirsty? And do you remember on the cross when Jesus died, his words to those gathered around the cross? Do you remember what did Jesus say? I thirst. And as for being a stranger, do you remember his words? Jesus was in the world and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. Jesus was a stranger. He came to what was his own and his own did not accept him. Jesus was certainly a stranger then. Jesus was thirsty. Jesus was hungry. Jesus was naked. And as for being sick, Jesus was in Gethsemane and his sweat become, became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. Jesus was sick. Jesus was led away to prison and his closest companion, Peter, followed at a distance and was asked three times if he knew him. And three times Peter denied it at the top of his voice. So we may have met Jesus face to face because we have seen Jesus hungry and thirsty and naked and a stranger and in prison. Jesus was in fact all of these things and those closest to him did not see him. They did nothing to help him. I think in our day, religion is a big issue. And especially as we think about world religions. Religion is a big issue in our world. I think as we think about the Jewish faith, as we think of the Islamic faith, and as we think about how do we learn to live together with all of these different religions. And there are those who think that in order to live in peace together with all of these different religions, we need to become less Christian and we need to become more tolerant of other people's religious views. That we need to let go of our faith convictions and grow more tolerant of others. But I would argue just the opposite. We who are Christian need to become more Christian for the sake of the world. Because the Christian ethic is built upon the conviction that God created everything, and more important, God created everyone. It is based upon the notion that all human beings are created in the image of God and are bearers of God-given dignity. That is the Christian way. That is the Christian thought, and no conviction or belief is more crucial. So you know anyone who is sick? That is where you will see Jesus. 
Do you know anyone who is hungry or homeless or in prison? Well, maybe not, but you know where to find them, and that is where you will see Jesus. Do you know someone who is a stranger, maybe even a stranger to the Christian faith? Still, the Christian ethic is that is where we will see Jesus in them. We need to be more Christian for the sake of the world. What matters is to look for Jesus Christ in the face of everyone, and especially in the face of those who are stranger to us, or hungry, or homeless, or a prisoner. We don't need to become less Christian. We need to become more Christian for the sake of the world. But of course, you already know this. You all already know this because you see Jesus. You see Jesus in the world. You see Jesus in your workplace. That's why you work such long hours and endure the challenges and the difficulties that you do in your workplace because you see Jesus there in the workplace. You also see Jesus in your spouse. You also see Jesus in your children and in your grandchildren and in your family. That's why you knock yourself out to work for them to make their lives better. You see Jesus when you are a student or when you're on the football field or basketball or a volleyball court or dance court. You see Jesus in all of these things. That's why you work so hard in your life. It's because you see Jesus and you are dedicated and you are committed to these things. Because you see the face of Jesus in those things. You see the face of Jesus in your aging parents who are now requiring so much more time and effort on your part. You see Jesus in all of these things. You see Jesus so clearly in all these areas of your life. And you live in a world where your affections are spread out so thin because on some days, maybe all days, it just seems like a bad committee meeting in your world. And, and anytime you get a little spare time, anytime you get a little extra time to maybe relax, somebody holds up a hand and says, I need your help. Pick me. Pick me. I need some of your attention. I need some of your love. I need some of your care. Because you see Jesus in all of these places in your life. You do the best you can to negotiate your time among all of these demands, trying to keep the peace within your soul, but trying to negotiate all of these competing claims on your time and energy and love is the worst place really to find peace. You see Jesus and you see the face of Jesus in so many areas in your life. So I have a few questions to ask you this morning. Where are you hungry? Where are you thirsty? Where are you naked? Where are you a stranger? Where are you in prison? You see, Jesus is in all these areas of your life as well. In all of your joys, and all of your struggles, Jesus enters in and he declares his kingdom in you and among you. Christ is king. Christ is king in 